chart sketch of the life of Leverton Thomas Young II. I have been asked by my son Bob to give a short sketch of my life. I have never had the inclination to do anything of the sort, neither have I the ability. I have been guilty of many sinful acts, which I feel sure no one would want me to say anything about. Besides, these sins are between me and my Lord. The only thing which I ever did of which I might boast was the raising of a family of nine children, all of whom are an asset to this great country of ours. First, let me tell you something of my religion. I am a Methodist. I have never belonged to any other church. However, I have visited a lot of other churches and have been close friends with a number of their pastors. I like the Methodist Church for many reasons. The principal one is the requirements for membership, the saving power of the Lord Jesus, and your willingness to pay for the upkeep of the church. After that, you are free to use your judgment of the scriptures. I despise those churches that compel you get that in my eyes. I despise those churches that compel its membership to interpret the Bible according to some set rules set down in books and pamphlets and hand it to one to swallow all. I have served for a good many years as a steward of my church and I think I know something about it. It changes with the times. They no longer have the classrooms or the mourner's bench, but it still believes in the saving power of the church. I recall one case that seems remarkable to me. There was a man who ran a saloon besides two hours of prostitution, who came to our church on the invitation of a couple of our men and finally joined our church together with his wife. This is the kind of work that would have pleased John Wesley, the founder of our church. It has been a long time since I have heard of a man who claimed he was sanctified holy, which I think is progress. This was the long-winded prayers and the so-called experiences which we used to have to endure pleases me. Now let us get on with my life story. I think you ought to know something of my great, uh, my great grandfather, who was a Pennsylvania Dutchman, one of several brothers. He settled in Pittsburgh and took up the work of digging coal. I know nothing of his other brothers except that they settled in central and southeastern Pennsylvania. My great grandfather had several children: George, John, Jake. Dan and two daughters that I know of, namely Mrs. Burns of Mount Oliver, whom I knew and visited many times. When I was a small boy and Mrs. Burns who lived in Zanesville. I don't know how they both married men by the name of, of Burns. I wish they may have married brothers. I never knew Mrs. Burns of Zanesville, but I knew one of her sons, George Burns, a Methodist preacher, who I have entertained in my home when I lived on East Main Street. This son, John, was my grandfather. He married Eleanor Brady of Irish Scott Stock. They had several children, James, L. Thomas, my father, Elizabeth, Jenny, Elmire, William, and L. Only Brady had a brother, Edward, who went west, settled at Davenport, and became a newspaper man. He had two sons, Oscar and Edward. Edward became an editor of Leslie's Magazine in, at New York City. And Oscar was editor of the Chicago Inter-Ocean. 
And to pursue her, I got the name of Lewerton Thomas. She was related to the Thomases, the Boers and Macombs of Washington County, Pennsylvania. Lewerton Thomas was a cousin of my grandmother, Eleanor, whom she liked very much. She also named my father after him. So my father handed it to me, and I gave it to my older son. I am proud of my name. My great-grandfather spelled his name A-U-N-G-S-T. So did my grandfather in his early manhood. How they came to spell it U-N-K-S, I do not know. Some of the tribes still spell it A-U-N-G-S-T. My mother, Magdalene Wagner, was born in the Sora region near Saarbrücken in the Rhine province of Germany. Her mother's name was Barbara and her father's John. They had several children, Annie Mary, Kate, Mary, Elizabeth, Margaret, John, and Magdalene, my mother, the youngest. My grandfather was a stonecutter and died in Germany of silicosis, as many stonecutters do. After he died, my grandmother took her family and immigrated to this country, all except the eldest, Anna Mary, who had come sometime before. The men were glad to get out of Germany to escape the three years military service that Germany required of all young men. They were all married but John and my mother, who was 11 years old. Annie Murray was married to Philip Smith, a winning glass bar. Kate to a, a farmer named Stokes. I was to, to a man named... Okay. Married to a man by the name of Glickner, a shoe factory owner. Margaret to a machinist, Martin Hinkle. John was a winning glass guy, and my mother was a tailor. My grandmother Barbara died before my time. John was starved to death in Andersonville prison in the Civil War. All the rest I knew. Elizabeth and Mary lived in New York City. All the rest in Pittsburgh. All my ancestors that I have known or heard about have been good citizens, mechanics, preachers, lawyers, doctors, and machinists. Some have drank to excess, but when you take into account the general practice of the day they lived in, one must forgive them. None that I ever heard tell of became downright sots. I was born in South Pittsburgh on Carson Street, two doors east of Fifth Street, April 23rd, 1867. So I am at this time past 87 years of age. Pittsburgh at this time was not the great big steel city that it is today. However, it had the, the beginnings of what it is today. Iron and glass was produced at this time in large quantities and shipped by rail and river all over the country. My father as well as my grandfather was a window glass blower. He was also a part owner of the cooperative glass factory of Knox Kimmon Company, which was located between First Street and the Smithfield Street Bridge. They afterwards built another factory on their property. Both of these factories have burned in the late 1880s, after which they bought the East End factory in Lancaster, uh, which was the cause of my coming uh, to the city of Lancaster, but more of that later. Many changes have come about in my life, from horse cars to cable cars, then to the trolley cars and firing the buses, from cobblestone streets to Belgian block, and then to asphalt streets as we have today. From the coal oil street lights to artificial gas lights, 
and the natural gas lights, and finally the moon electrical lights we have today, together with the bright neon lights. From the primitive railroad of those days to the great diesel engines and air-conditioned cars of today, the great airplanes that fly all over the world, and great ocean liners that replace the sailboats that sailed the seas when I was born. When I was a boy, they had the theater, both of the drama and variety kinds, where the dime museum introduced by P.T. Barnum. Now we have the majestic stage, besides the, the great movies that talk and play over great stages that stagger the imagination. Radios that span the whole earth are in every home. Now the great TV, which brings the theater right into your own home with drama, comedy, and news. Most of the development of electricity has occurred in my lifetime. The greatest advancement of steel industry and glass. Wonderful machines that moves in almost human maneuvers. The telegraph and telephone, natural gas piped all over the United States. From the old washboard to the appliances of all kinds we have today. The electrical heating and cooling and all kinds of household chores are done by gadgets we have today. That is a far cry from my boyhood days. In my own business, there has been great progress. From the hand blown cylinder, we now have the great sheet drawing machines which can draw any thickness from picture glass to plate and do it continually for many months. You see, I was born in quite a primitive time compared to the present. We had none of the comforts of these days. Our food consisted mostly of meats and dried foods with some canned goods put up by my mother. Most boys and girls in my time were bull-legged for one of proper foot. You seldom see a bull-legged child now because we are fed by shipped in goods from the south all year round. I did not get to school until I was seven years old because they tore down the school when they put in the Pittsburgh, Virginia and Charleston Railroad. And the new school was not yet finished. The new school was called the Knox School. It was in the 30th Ward. Each ward had a school. It has been torn down now to make room for improvements. It was situated near the tubes that go through the hill, hill now. My life in the ward school was a very ordinary one. I got good grades in arithmetic, geography, and history, but poor in grammar and conduct. I thought grammar and English was a waste of time as I always intended to be a glass bar. I've been very sorry for that opinion many times since. I don't think the teachers liked me, so they just gave me 50 or 60 in conduct on general principles, whether I did anything or not. They used to send notes to my father by my sister Eleanor, but she always gave them to me. Glad to stick it in the water. But I'm getting ahead of my story. I lived in the house I was born only a short time. When a baby we moved to 413 Carson Street. The house was in the middle of a block, which was just a half block west of the place I was born. We lived in uh, this house until I was about nine years old. Some years later, my father bought the, this house with the uh, ones on each side of it. During the years I lived here, they built the PV and seat and charged the railroad, tore down the houses across the street, and built a freight house and west of it in a coal yard. As a boy, I watched all this from our house and I remember much of it yet today. Although some of this work I remember was done when I was only two years old. I still
started the school when I was seven. Nothing of much importance happened to me at this time that I remember. One thing that I will never forget is my sister's birth, which occurred on my fifth birthday. My father caught me spitting on my on a neighbor's hired girl and gave me a spanking that is vivid to my memory today. I've never spit on anyone since. When I was about nine, we moved to uh, 105 Carson Street, which was the second house from First Street. There I began to play around the neighborhood on a baseball diamond and around the river, where I learned to swim and dive. I must have been a thorn in the side of my parents as they were always afraid I would get drowned. All summer long, I spent my days on the ball field and in the river. We had rigged up a trapeze and horizontal bar in an old abandoned factory. I was pretty good on them for a kid. There was an old circus man by the name of Harry Hart who taught us to tumble. He intended to take me and a couple of the other kids with him on his tightrope walking tour of the country. But my dad put a stop to that, so I never did get into circus business. I was nearly drowned in February River Rise one time when I was nosing around some log rafts that were moored under the railroad bridge. A father by the name of Haney grabbed me and pulled me out. Some of the boys broke their arms learning to do tricks on the bar and trapeze. So the old daddies took away all our playthings and destroyed them. When I was 10 years old, my sister died. I was in the room when she breathed her last. I thought she had gone to sleep. This was a very sad time for our family, and I was much affected. One of the very kindest persons at this time was my father's cousin, Frank Oaks, a Presbyterian preacher, a son of my father's uncle, George Oaks. Every Sunday after Clara was buried in the South Side Cemetery, I walked out to see her grave. But Five mile high, about a five mile high. I did this for several years, every summer. In 1876, my father took me to New York to visit my mother's sisters. One of my uncles had just been drowned in the Delaware River on his way to the Centennial in Philadelphia. He fell off ferry boat somewhere or other. He was a piano maker. My other uncle in New York had a shoe factory. I had a great time on this trip. Dad seemed to like me a lot. I suppose he thought that I would be something out of the ordinary. Well, maybe I was, but not the way Dad would have me. When I was a boy, there were great river bottoms every few blocks. Two hundred by 400 feet or 500 feet inside. These bottoms is where I learned to skate and play ball. They were nearly level and made great ball fields and places to skate. In the winter when the river would rise and cover these bottoms, the water would freeze a half or an inch, a half or an inch in thickness. Then the river would go down and leave this cover of ice flat on the ground. This made a great place to skate without the danger that was encountered on the river. Sometimes it would break through and get a cover of yellow mud. These made great ball fields. And I spent much of my summers playing ball on them. I learned to skate when I was nine or ten years old in the in the later 1870s, along about 
about this time I learned, among other things, to chew the back of the smoke. This did not seem to please anyone but myself. I quit using tobacco in 1912. I do not think I was a very good boy. I did all kinds of other things. I was a pretty good swimmer, and I could row a boat above the Irish kid. We used to have corner loafers at this time, and of course I was one of them. We used to gather on the corner of the square and chew and smoke and talk and maybe pick a fight out of some boy who did not live in our neighborhood. This practice has become obsolete these days. About this time we moved to a more pretentious house on Carson Street at the foot of Brownsville Avenue. The summer before Dad took me to Buffalo and Niagara Falls. He did this to bribe me into going to college, but I wanted to learn to blow glass. I knew they made more money than any white collar man in those days. I knew Dad made 50 or 60 dollars a day. Not many did as well in those days. Not that I knew about it. The end was that a bookkeeper learned to blow a window glass. Well, before I leave my school days, I would like to tell of some of my teachers who I think were fine ladies and good teachers. That was Ella McCutcheon, a tall lady, a very fine teacher. Miss Neely, a redhead with a fiery temper, but a fine teacher. When she became angry, she would start getting red behind the ears, and finally it would spread all over her face. I had fun with her, but she was a good teacher. Miss Marshall and the Nelson sisters, one of whom was rather short and bow-legged. We called her Betty Nelson. I liked all of these ladies. W.P. Montgomery was the principal. He wore a beard, which he had the habit of twisting when he was angry. He beat me up on several occasions. I might tell you of some of the boys I left with. There was Joe Armstrong, who later became the first mayor of Greater Pittsburgh. He had two brothers, Tom and William. Tom was a great rough and tumble fighter. He just enjoyed it. He always laughed when he was fighting, so we called him Falks. There was George Ambrose. He was a pretty good fighter, too. But he wanted to be a speech maker. He would get a hold of a word and use it until he became familiar with it. We used to make fun of him, but he did finally become a very good public speaker. Charlie Gearing, Posey Flowers, Charlie Dixon, Joe Selinski, the son of a Polish count, Harris Beebe, he became a pro baseball pitcher, just to name a few of the boys who were intimate friends of mine. I started work in the factory in February 1884, just after the big flood. I might say in passing that this was before there was any United States Weather Bureau. Uh, heavy rains in those days meant the loss of very much property. Booth, Lawrence Barrett, Majeski, and a lot of others. 
once a week. I saw a variety of shows with six stars, McIntyre, and Heath, Pat Rooney, Maggie Klein, and the host of I wore good clothes, always made to order. No one who could afford to wear custom clothes would be caught dead in a ready-made suit. I had my shoes made to order, as well as my suits. I made a trip to Chicago when Harrison was nominated as a candidate for president. I was a man about town. The toll keeper on the bridge at Smithfield Street told me one day that it was a good thing everybody did not know as much about me as he did. I read a lot of books, both good and bad. I was always fond of reading. I think I read all the books in our public school library, and a lot that I borrowed from the St. Philomenes Library, a Catholic church on Liberty Street. I also read a lot of dime novels in spite of the fact that my dad forbade me not to read them. When I was a young boy, Pittsburgh was full of dives and doggeries of all kinds. One of these, one of them was Van Essence dump on the waterfront. He had a saloon, a museum with a pig that played cards, and a butterfly collection. A dance hall and girls in rooms for any and all who wanted them. I give this as an illustration. There were a lot of others about like it, like my message. I attended a lot of dances, some select and some what we call butter dancing. Butter was the name we gave the girls that attended these dances. Many times I went to work without any sleep. I've come home from work the next day and I fall asleep changing my clothes and lay there all the night through. We do not have any radios, TV, or movies to go to, so we just kill time with what we had. I drank some, not very much, all through my boyhood days. My dad used to take me with him to the saloon and sit me on the car while he drank his, his beer. Of course, I got a taste or two. My mother sure did a hate drink of all kinds. If she had her way, there would not be any. She used to tell me, Tommy, I don't know which I hate worse, drink, gambling, or fast women. I think she had the idea I was guilty on all three counts. She was a wiser woman than I had given her credit for. We used to have fishing clubs in those days. I belonged to two, the M.G. Frank Club and the Pennsylvania Sportsman's Club. These clubs would go out somewhere and pitch their tents and fish and loaf about it in the country. They also drank a lot of beer. I remember the time when President Garfield was shot. I was sad at that. I had been a member of a junior marching club before the election. I belonged to junior marching clubs of Hayes and Wheeler, Garfield and Arthur and Blaine and Logan. We seemed to take great interest in politics when I was a boy. I always read all the political news of the day. I wonder if the kids of the day are interested in our country's welfare as we were. I haven't told you anything about the women and myself. I always liked them, but I was shy around them. We had our little parties where we played kissing games. I can remember how they acted. Some would just deal and give you a kiss. Some would be passive and yielding. And some would fight and try to keep from being kissed. But they liked it just the same. I've had the pleasure of knowing quite a few ladies since I have grown to manhood. Some nice and some not so nice. But you would not have me, want me to tell you about them. It would not be polite and 
gentleman always keeps your lady secret. But the worst thing that happened in my boyhood was the great railroad strike of 1877. I was 10 years old. I did not go to the scene of the riot, but I could see the smoke from the fire I saw men and women carry great loads of goods they took from the cars in the depot. This is one of the worst disasters ever to occur in Pittsburgh. It came out of a strike. They had the military out. Many were killed and wounded. The other disasters that affected Pittsburgh was caused by the rivers. About every year, Pittsburgh suffered from high water. I think it's about time for me to leave Pittsburgh. I might go farther into the details of my life as a boy and young man, but you uh, use your imagination and you can about guess the rest. In 1891, in September, I came to Lancaster to work. I was 24 years old. I was hired to build a big place in the factory owned by Abel Smith and Company and managed by my father, who was also a part owner of the factory. I knew nothing of a small city. It was a novelty to me. Banks at this time was about 4,500 people, and they had a lot of natural gas. It was a county seat. I had two, it had two small agricultural factories and some tailors. That was all, brother. No paved streets, only one theater that only had shows at long intervals. You had to work, go to church, or run around with a girl to kill time. This was duck soup for me. Every time a train came to town, all the young folks would go down to the depot to see who got off the trains. Some of the girls went down to comfort the traveling men who might get off to do a little business. This will give you an idea of what Lancaster was like when I first came here. I first lived at the Martin House, and then moved to a boarding house. Folks were astounded at the money we made. There's no one in Lancaster ever made over 10 or 15. Common labor only paid 75 or 80 cents a day. The motors at the Eagle Works and Hogan Valley Works only earned about a dollar a day, while I was making 30 or 50 dollars a day. I soon got acquainted with a lot of folks, which was not hard, as this was a very friendly little city. Everyone knew everyone else and all about each other. I had a lot of fun, as this kind of life was new to me. I know one family hardly knew his next door neighbor. I met a lot of girls, but one little girl kind of struck my fancy. So on January 31st, 1893, I married her. She was the daughter of Cassius Cannon, a painter by trade, but a pro gambler by profession. Her mother was Elizabeth Richards Cannon. Both the Cannons and Richards were old pioneer stock of this community. Alice was her name. We lived together until October the 3rd, 1898, when she died. She was a nice little girl and I liked her a lot. During the time I was married to Alice, I had moved to Marion, Indiana, where I lived and worked for about two years. When I returned to Lancaster, I also worked a while at Finley, uh, just a short time before she died. Since then, I have lived continually in Lancaster. In 1890, 1899, I joined the Masonic Fraternity, which was a new field of endeavor for me. I've been very much interested in it ever since. I received about all the honors they bestow on anyone. My business was getting more and more improvements until the method that I used finally became
became obsolete. That put uh, me out of business. Out of a bit, I spent uh, about all my life in learning. But it is a good thing for the people in general. About 1902, I had the good fortune of meeting Stella Seabier. I was struck with her at once, and I lost no time in making a date with her. I liked her very much and wanted to marry her, but I was 14 years older than she was, so I hesitated. I knew she liked me, so I talked it over with her and told her I was too old for her. She was very much disappointed, but I left her with the intention of never seeing her again. I went to Pittsburgh, but I had a loan for Stella, so I wrote her a letter or two, and when I came back to Lancaster, I saw her and talked it over with her, and she said she didn't care how old I was. Stella's mother was a wise man. families of this community, uh, good uh, farmers and merchants. Her father was Peter Bew. He was the son of John Bew, a soldier of the Revolutionary War. He settled in this community on a land grant issued by the government to soldiers of the, uh, the American Revolution. So if any of my children want to join the, the daughters of the American Revolution or the sons of the American Revolution, they're entitled to it. So on the 9th of March, 1904, we were married. This was the beginning of the best part of my life. So I was a lovely person. <clears throat> and I was never so happy as when I was with her. I have lived with her 49 years, and in all that time, we never had an argument that we could not settle with a kiss. We raised a family of nine children. <clears throat> Six boys and three girls. The, the, the nine of these are married and all are good citizens and they credit to this great country of ours. There are 13 grandchildren, nine boys and four girls at this time. I consider this a great accomplishment, far greater than if I had accumulated a very great amount of money. I might go into details about these children, but you would not have me brag about them. Their lives will speak for themselves. So far, they spell success. That is all I care for. On the 10th of April, 1953, my beloved Stella had passed to her reward and left me very long. Soon I will fire. I feel that I belong to another generation. All of my associates but one are gone, and I feel out of place. I'm treated very kindly by my children. Folks in general are nice and considerate, but I realize that my day is done and I am a stranger in my own mind. This is L. Thomas Oaks on the 8th of July, 1904.